Thank you for the invitation and your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. What would happen if one were, hypothetically speaking, to rerun the tape of life? Is the emergence of human life an inevitable product of biological evolution? Or are humans a mere product of Lady Luck in disguise, an improbable event resulting from the concurrence of various circumstances and happenings, all of which have such a low probability that any replay of evolution would, for all that we know, yield widely different results. Consider the following thought experiment. Quote number one. You press the rewind button and, making sure you thoroughly erase everything that actually happened, go back to any time and place in the past. Then let the tape run again and see if the repetition looks at all like the original. If each replay strongly resembles life's actual pathway, then we must conclude that what really happened pretty much had to occur. But suppose that the experimental revisions, versions all yield sensible results strikingly different from the actual history of life. This famous thought experiment captures the essence of the controversy between paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould and Simon Conway Morris. The trigger and empirical basis for this controversy about the repeatability of biological evolution was the reinvestigation of the Birch's Shale of British Columbia, one of the most important fossil localities, enabling paleontologists to study the period after the Cambrian explosion and its immediate aftermath. This debate, ostensibly about the interpretation of fossils, has implications for the possible direction of biological evolution and the probability of the emergence of human life. In this paper, I shall first discuss the scientific basis for this famous controversy. Then I shall turn to the notion of providence that seems to underlie the debate. In the second part, I will present a Thomistic perspective on the topic making use of the theory of primary and secondary accusation, consistently embedded in the doctrine of divine providence, which I shall interpret teleologically. In his book, Wonderful Life, Stephen Jay Gould presented in 1989 the case of the Birch's shame to a wider public audience challenging conventional iconographies of the ladder of progress and the cone of increasing diversity. He argues that the reinvestigation of the fossils of the Birch's shale calls for a new view of the history of life as radically contingent rather than progressive and predictable. Taking these fossils as an ex exemplary case study Gould argues for the significance of historical contingency in biological evolution. He states, quote two, the Birch's shale fossils have confronted our traditional view about progress and predictability in the history of life with the historian's challenge of contingency. The pageant of evolution as a staggeringly improbable series of events, sensible enough in retrospect, and subject to rigorous explanation, but utterly unpredictable and quite unrepeatable. The new view of life Gould advocates in this quotation is based on contingency rather than the two conventional pillars of progress and predictability. As Gould famously puts it, almost every interesting event of life's history falls into the realm of contingency. There are, as the citation at the beginning of the paper suggests, two scenarios to consider. 
and Gould offers two corresponding explanations. The outcome of the replays could either resemble the factual world or look rather different. For either survivors prevail for cause, Gould's phrase for adaptive superiority, in which case he argues each replay will yield similar results, or survivors do not prevail for cause, on which grounds Gould seeks to establish the improbability of the emergence of human life. The problem with survival for cause is, according to Gould, that the adaptive superiority must be explicable beforehand. Otherwise, the slogan, survival of the fittest, becomes tautological, survival of those who survive. Fitness must be predictable. Thus, Gould makes the criterion of being able to pick out the winners beforehand the basis of his arguments against survival for cause. But if we face the Birch's shale fauna honestly, Gould contends, we must admit that we have no evidence whatsoever, not a shred, that losers in the Great Decimation were systematically inferior in adaptive design to those that survived. For this reason, Gould concludes with a prediction that has since become a widely influential statement. Quote number three. Wind back the tape of life to the early days of the Birch's shale. Let it play again from an identical starting point and the chance becomes vanishingly small that anything like human intelligence would grace the replay. On his view, the evolution of the human species is extremely improbable. Any replay of the tape of life would lead evolution down a pathway radically different from the road actually taken. According to Gould, we are left with two options. Either to accept that we are an unintended product of history, or to close our eyes to the apparent fact that life is a mere product of chance. Gould rejects a view of life's history as the fulfillment of a divine purpose, a phrase, incidentally, that shows the way in which he conflates or even identifies evolutionary directionality with God's providential care. He states, quote four, if the history of life shows God's direct benevolence in its ordered march to human consciousness, then decimation by lottery with a hundred thousand possible outcomes and so very few leading to any species with self-conscious intelligence cannot be an option for the fossil record. What Gould is effectively describing here is the not uncommon few that believe in providence implying God's guidance of the evolutionary processes, amounts to a belief in predictable progress or evolutionary directionality. In other words, if one equates providence with the two pillars of the conventional view, namely predictability and progress, then one will arrive at the conclusion that if and insofar as this world evolves predictably and progressively, God may be acting in evolution. But if it turns out that evolution is a contingent, unpredictable and non-progressive process, then we will have to abandon the concept of providence. In his book, The Crucible of Creation, published in 1998, Simon Conway Morris sets out to challenge Gould's presentation of the Birch's shale fossils. The lesson Con Conway Morris draws from the fossils is that it is not so much evolutionary contingency as the ubiquity 
of evolutionary convergence that accounts for the history of life. His goal is to counteract the thesis that the evolution of human life is undirected. Conway Morris agrees with Gould that the Burgess shale fauna gives new and rich insight into the nature of the Cambrian explosion, but disagrees that the scientific discoveries call for a radically new view of the history of life. One reason why Conway Morris rejects Gould's view of the life of the view of life are evolutionary convergences, being defined as the recurrent tendency of biological organization to arrive at the same solution to a particular need. Evolutionary convergence is the widespread phenomenon that biological organisms resemble each other despite having different ancestors, that is to say, all they, do, they originate within different lineages. Life, as it were, comes up with similar solutions to a problem. For example, cyber-toothed cats and cyber-toothed tigers are well separated in evolutionary history, but have very similar large canines extended from the mouth. These convergences show, according to Conway Morris, that the types of organisms that can emerge through the process of biological evolution are not only limited, but severely constrained. Not everything is possible. In fact, in biological evolution, many things are impossible. Thus, Conway Morris profoundly disagrees about the role contingency place in the history of life. Quote five. The reason for discussing convergence here is that its recognition effectively undermines the main plank of Gould's argument on the role of contingent processes in shaping the tree of life. Put simply, contingency is inevitable but unremarkable. It need not provoke discussion because it matters not. There are not an unlimited number of ways of doing something. For all its exuberance, the forms of life are restricted and channeled. While the evolutionary pathways are innumerable, the end results of these developments are severely constrained. These constraints are evident in the various evolutionary convergences. Hence, Conway Morris argues that the outcome of the evolutionary process, although not its particular pathway, seems to be rather predictable. On Conway Morris's view, then, there is a directionality in evolution. Biological evolution is quasi-directed or constrained towards certain recurrent biological properties. It is with respect to these that Conway Morris contests Gould's thesis. Rerun the tape of life as often as you like, and the end result will be much the same. This directionality incorporates contingency, but renders it irrelevant for the outcome of the evolutionary features evolutionary convergence trumps Gullian contingency. Conway Morris is widely applauded for having stood against the Gullian view of life's history as utterly contingent and without directionality, thus having secured a theologically acceptable view of the evolution of life. Humans are not a random accident, but rather an inevitable product of the evolutionary history. So much for the controversy between Stephen Jay Gould and Simon Conway Morris. What is the conclusion that we can draw from these considerations? Is biological evolution a directional process or not? While Gould initially stated 
that his thought experiment cannot possibly be performed, I note that recent developments show that the biological sciences are in fact making some process, progress towards an empirical adjudication. Although no definite conclusion has yet been reached, the direction to which this new evidence points is that evolution might be much more predictable than previously thought. A recent review paper concludes, quote six, while it is too early to derive any definite conclusions, recent observations suggest that there are predictable portions within slice tape and that evolution might not be as unpredictable as one thought 25 years ago when Stephen Jay Gould famously, when Stephen Jay Gould formulated this, uh, his original question. As stated in this conclusion, accumulating evidence suggests a more predictable course of evolution than Gould's hypothesis. Although the common consensus holds that the evidence is far from decisive to settle the question of the repeatability of biological evolution. On, the, on this scientific issue, the jury is still out. And I come to the second part of my paper. What is of interest for the present purpose, however, is not so much the scientific conclusion but rather the question of the theological relevance of this debate. In contrast to the implications some have drawn from the controversy, I argue that the notion of providence that underlies this debate is theologically wanting. The wide resonance of the debate is indicative of a deep discomfort among many Christians that a lack of goal-directedness in evolution might render obsolete the doctrine of providence. That scientific directionality and divine purpose are inextricably linked. Despite their different assessment of the significance of contingency, the opposed positions seem to agree at least on this, that God's providential guidance of evolution implies directionality in the scientific sense. Philosopher of biology Michael Roos, for instance, writes, quote seven, for the Christian, human beings are necessary. Their arrival in this universe is not a matter of chance or whim, might have been, might not have been, and here's the rub. Evolution through natural selection makes all this very problematic. Rousey explains that according to the Christian doctrine of providence, human beings had to evolve, but that evolution does not show the necessary directionality. The theological doctrine of providence supposedly lacks warrant because the scientific description of evolution does not imply a directionality towards human beings. What is telling about Rousey's comment is that he thinks that science is needed to fix the problem of providence. The non-directionality of evolution is a problem for theology that needs a scientific resolution, namely evolutionary directionality. What is theologically questionable about proposals linking providence and directionality in this manner is the assumption that the doctrine of divine providence requires the kind of directionality science can describe. Put differently, if biological evolution does not exhibit an overall directionality, then by implication, God did not guide the evolutionary process. Alistair McGrath recently spoke of a secularization of providence in the evolutionary debate, by which he means the substitution of providence by evolutionary directionality. He urges not to conflate such a secular alternative 
based on evolutionary directionality with the theological doctrine of divine providence. Consequently, attempts to present the theory of evolution as a defeater of the doctrine of divine providence appear to be theologically flawed. What is objectionable in such attempts is the implication that an absence of a universal directionality from the scientific account of evolution speaks against divine providence. So far, I've argued that the contingency debate is of interest to theology because divine providence should not be taken to be identical with directionality in evolution. By considering Thomas Aquinas' doctrine of providence, I shall now suggest that a model of divine providence should not restrict itself to the statement that evolution is directional. Rather, the thesis is that God directs nature. A theological perspective then is not um, concerned exclusively with natural processes, but also takes into the consideration God's activity in these processes. It is not the claim that if you replay the tape of life, from a natural point of view, human beings will inevitably evolve again. But rather, the implication is that God has somehow brought forth human beings in this, the actually existing tape of life, however likely that scenario might be from a scientific point of view. In turning to the Thomistic perspectives, let us redefine providence with St. Thomas as the ordering of things to an end. So providence is the ordering of things to an end. God orders in his providence all created things to an end. Two things need to be distinguished. First, providence in the strict sense of the word denotes the eternal plan of or reason for the ordering of all created things to an end. By contrast, the concept of government refers to the temporal execution of this ordering. So while providence is eternal, and a reality in the divine mind, government is temporal and a reality in the world. As such, God can govern the world either by his divine causation only, what we traditionally call miracles, or mediated through so-called secondary causes. The doctrine of primary and secondary causation is a traditional theory about the relation, interaction or interconnectedness of divine and creaturely causation. Secondary causes are a form of caused causation. Secondary causes presuppose the causal involvement of a primary cause for their very causation. According to St. Thomas, God creates and conserves all creaturely powers by virtue of which agents act. But God also and necessarily applies these created and conserved powers to act, and he does so in an instrumental manner. That is to say, God, the principal cause, makes use of the powers of the instrument beyond what it could achieve on its own accord and through its own powers. He writes, quotations 8 and 9. The power of the inferior agent, however, depends on the power of the superior agent, inasmuch as the superior agent gives the power itself to the inferior agent through which it acts, or conserves it, or also applies it to act. In this manner, therefore, God is the cause of each action inasmuch as he first gives the power to act and inasmuch as he second conserves it and inasmuch as he third applies the action and inasmuch as he fourth 
And inasmuch as forth every other power acts by virtue of his power. Think of it this way. Imagine a prudent and benevolent queen reigning over her kingdom. If she decides to promulgate a royal order directing her subjects to their flourishing, the reason and plan of this the reason for and plan of this ordering will be immediate to her, while its execution will usually be mediated through her ministers. They put into practice, realize, and exercise the queen's providential order. If the queen will so, she can bestow the power to execute her order on her ministers. Her ministers then enact the order in virtue of her royal power. Thus, although it is her order that directs the subjects, and the ministers can enforce it only in virtue of her power and not simply by themselves, the queen does in no way push or pull and hence act upon her ministers. Rather, the ministers contribute to the realization of the royal order by their own doing. Secondary causes are like ministers of a benevolent queen. Apart from miracles, God acts in the world in and through created beings, like the queen executing her order through ministers. He acts through created agents because he knows and wills secondary causes to have their own causality and decides to work in them so intimately that his causation is the constant and active causal precondition of everything happening in nature. What is most important to see in this connection is the fact that providence thus conceived governs every instantiation of natural causation, every single manifestation of a natural power. Without divine primary causation, no secondary causation. We have seen that the notion of providence refers to the fact that God orders all secondary causes to an end. But can God order evolution as the conglomerate of evolutionary processes to an end? And if so, what kind of directionality does God's providence imply? In the biological context, the term evolution denotes most fundamentally a form of change, an actualization of potency traditionally described as a change over time via descent with modification. This type of change is typically taken to occur between generations within a species population. The specific kind of change evolution denotes is the change between generations within a population lineage. By contrast, biological evolution does not refer to any individual developmental change, that is, change within the life of an organism. Only groups of organisms, so-called populations, evolve from a common ancestral population. As the Encyclopedia of Evolution puts it, Biological evolution stripped to its barest essential is nothing more than the temporal change in the genetic makeup of populations. Now, however biological species exactly map onto philosophical species, it is reasonable to assume that if this change via descent with modification is really a becoming ontologically more rather than simply a becoming otherwise. An evolution of biological species and a transformation of higher forms and irreducibly different kinds of life, then evolution must imply, philosophically speaking, substantial rather than merely accidental change. What evolves are not only 
properties, but different kinds of beings. In line with other Thomistic scholars, I would like to suggest for the present purpose to explicate biological evolution philosophically as a transformation of substantial forms of groups of organisms or populations changing over time where the gradual alteration of the disposition of prime matter eventually results in an adduction of a new substantial form. The evolution of snakes may serve as an example to illustrate the idea. According to biologist Nicano Austriaco, it is a generally accepted view that snakes evolved from lizards. The evolution of snakes from lizards took place over a long period of time with various genetic events contributed um, and various genetic events contributed to this evolutionary transformation. Following Austriaco, we can imagine, for the sake of simplicity, the evolutionary transformation having occurred through the mating of lizards with unique genetic material, leading to a speciation with regard to their offspring. Lizard 1 and lizard 2 each underwent or inherited various genetic changes, which, if put into a single genome, would specify a snake, produce as offspring an animal that belongs and is classified according to the new species snake. Consider the following hypothetical scenario, quote number 10. A mutation in the sonic hedgehog SSG gene enhancer could lead to four-limbed lizards giving rise to lizard offspring that lack rare limbs. This would be accidental change. However, philosophically speaking, this SHH mutation would also alter the disposition of the two-legged lizard's matter, such that it is now predisposed to the novel substantial form that specifies two-legged lizards as a distinct natural kind. If this mutant two-legged lizard were to mate with another mutant lizard bearing the same SHH genetic mutation, then they would generate lizard offspring that permanently lacked rare limbs. This would be substantial change. In this example, substantial change occurs due to accidental changes via a gradual alteration of the disposition of matter. Since substantial forms are educed from the potency of prime matter, the properly disposed matter will eventually lead to and call for a substantial change. The technical term adduction here denotes the drawing out of a form from the potency of matter. Substantial forms of corporeal beings are neither created nor generated, for subject to generation and corruption are only the composites of form and matter, namely substances, not the principles of being, that is, form and matter. Form is not made but it used, wherefore adduction is an essential part of any reduction of potency to actuality. It goes without saying that this transition presupposes an agent, a being in act. Agents or efficient causes do not only educe forms from the potency of matter, but also dispose prime matter, namely by acting on given matter, transforming the substance by inducing new forms from the potency of the matter of the substance undergoing change. Suppose a lizard with a set of specific genetic mutation gives rise to offspring with less limbs. This would count as accidental change. The lizard, SM1, 
Um, so second matter is a composition of substantial form and uh, prime matter. So the lizard SM1, without the accidental form caused by the genetic mutation, forms a different accidental unity, accident 1, than the lizard SM2 with the new accidental form AF2. Now, the lizard undergoing accidental change from AF1 to AF2, possessing a specific set of genetic mutations, also faces a change in the disposition of its prime matter from PM1 to PM2. Prime matter, PM2, is now predisposed to a new substantial form. Note that this is not yet substantial change for the substantial form of the two accidental unities are identical, SF1 equals SF2. Both the lizard with and the one without the accidental change are lizards. Once the prime matter of the accidentally changed lizard, substance 1, is properly predisposed to a new substantial form, a substantial change will occur. In this instance, a new substantial form, SF3, is educed from the potency of prime matter, PM2. The lizard, having undergone various accidental changes since their prime matter having been predisposed over a long period of time, will eventually give rise to offspring with a new substantial form. While the dispositioning of matter is a gradual process, the induction of a new substantial form happens instantaneously. Through a process of accidental changes, the disposition of prime matter is gradually disproportionated to its current substantial form and proportionated to a new substantial form. But while the process of altering the disposition of prime matter might indeed, through various mutations and variations, be a long and gradual one, the substantial change from one substantial form to another must, on this view, happen instantaneously. For according to Thomistic metaphysics, there can only be one substantial form, um, in f uh, there can only be one substantial form at a time in forming prime matter. In this way, evolution can be philosophically viewed as a process of substantial transformation which can take place because accidental changes dispose prime matter to new substantial forms. Efficient causes gradually dispose matter and deduce the new substantial form from the potency of prime matter. So much for the, the general outline. There are at least two sets of objections commonly raised against such a Thomistic approach. Both objections can be answered by looking more closely at the role primary causation plays in secondary causation, that is, the nature of God's providential primary causation in and through all secondary causes. The first objection states that evolution or at least a Thomistic account of it, violates the principle of proportionate causality. The evolutionary assumption that an effect may sometimes have different and higher perfection than its proximate cause possessed seems to contradict the philosophical principle that no cause can bring forth an effect of higher actuality. The actuality contained in the cause must at least equal the actuality in its effect. But note that in the evolutionary case, it is the proximate cause and not the adequate cause that is said to possess less perfection than the effect. It would indeed be contradictory to claim 
that in effect possesses more being than the adequate cause. If we distinguish between adequate and proximate causes, the following scenario suggests itself. The adequate cause is something other than the isolated proximate cause. What accounts for the actuality in the effect is either, as some Thomists have suggested, the conglomerate of natural causes or a principal cause instrumentally using the proximate cause. So first a reply might uh, so first, a reply might question whether the proportionate cause always has to be a separate cause, or whether it might at times be a conglomerate of causes which combined could account for the actuality. As many scholastic authors have pointed out, however, a solution concerning the principle of proportionate causality is in any case at hand if we employ some form of instrumental causation. In this line of argument, the principal cause explains where the actuality that the proximate cause lacks comes from. Michael Dodd's comments, quote 11. Instrumental causation shows us that an effect may be greater than its immediate cause. So higher species may be brought forth from lower species if the natural causes of this process are also an instrumental cause of a higher principal cause. That higher cause is ultimately God, the universal cause of nature. So if God not only creates and conserves all creaturely powers, but also applies them to act and does so in an instrumental manner that is beyond what the cause could achieve of its own accord, then nothing speaks against accounting for the actuality lacking in the proximate cause by an instrumental use of the latter. This explanation would be available even if the conglomerate of proximate causes in their interconnectedness were insufficient to account for the emergence of new forms of life. A second objection that is often raised states that chance and contingency in nature preclude any kind of divine guidance or goal directedness of creation. In other words, contingent processes are necessarily unguided. We have seen that an evolutionary actualization of potency can only be brought forth by an appropriate and proportionate agent. And the verdict is that this actualization is, at least in the case of biological evolution, an essentially contingent happening. In reply, one could argue that God can providentially guide contingent happenings. That is because he is traditionally conceived of as a transcendent and universal agent. And as such, God is not limited in the way creatures are. On Thomas's account, contingency is an essential difference of creaturely causation and thus a feature of secondary causes. Contingency means that something is not fully determined in its nature to either being or non-being. God, the primary cause, however, can order contingent secondary causes on two presuppositions, namely him being transcendent and universal agent. By transcendent agent, I mean an agent that is eternal, and therefore outside the order of time and space, and the source of all being, and therefore outside the order of beings. Think of it this way. If a geometer intends to draw a triangle, she must decide whether to draw an isosceles, 
scalene or equilateral triangle. You cannot just draw a triangle without deciding on its essential difference. Similarly, God cannot just create a cause without deciding on its essential difference, namely whether it be contingent or necessary. For this reason, it is not only compatible that God infallibly wills and orders contingent events, rather, given this framework, it is necessary that God be the cause of all contingency and necessity in the world. God's primary causation is unique because as transcendent agent, he is outside both the order of time and space and the order of beings. A universal agent is an agent whose causation universally extends to everything. There is nothing outside its causal reach, so to speak. Everything is causally reducible to this kind of cause. God is a universal cause in this sense. Everything, including what diverges from a particular cause, is part of his causal nexus as primary cause. Hence, what falls outside the causal order of a particular cause falls within the causal order of the universal cause in another respect. If we combine the two insights, we can say that God as transcendent and universal agent orders all things to an end, including contingent things, insofar as he is the transcendent cause of the fact that contingency exists, and the universal cause ordering even causes causing causal deviation to ends. On this account, then, interferences of causally unrelated causes, commonly labeled chance, cannot exist with regard to God's primary causation, although they can and do exist in secondary causation. God's providence is certain in this respect. As Bernard Lonigan puts it, quote number 12, to St. Thomas, providence was certain in each case because it was the cause of all cases. The mover moves the moved if the pair are in the right neutral relation, disposition, proximity. The mover does not if any other cause prevents the fulfillment of this condition. But both the combinations that result in motion and the interferences that prevent it must ultimately be reduced to God, who is universal cause. And therefore, divine providence cannot be frustrated. What happens cannot happen unless God knows and wills the causes involved to exist and exhibit the causal characteristics they do. As primary cause, he, he orders all causes to an end and all possible interferences are part of his providential plan. At least insofar as everything, insofar as it is, causally reduces back to him as primary cause. Secondary causes would then account for evolution insofar as they are subsumed under the order of providence. Conclusion. The goal directedness of biological evolution is a scientifically rather controversial question. Notwithstanding the fact that evolution may or may not be directed towards an overall goal from a scientific point of view, I have suggested in this paper that from a theological point of view, evolution is directed towards the origin of human life, indeed towards the realization of all ends intended and willed by God. With this conclusion, I do not propose to split reality. There is but one. Rather, I suggest that it is 
methodologically possible to abstract from primary causation in the natural sciences and hold, and hold all the same that if we take into the consideration God's universal and transcendent government of all secondary operations, then even naturally undirected events can be directed by God to particular ends. Thus God's transcendent providence does not necessarily rely on progress and predictability in biological explanations. In fact, I've shown that a secularized notion of providence diverges from divine providence in assuming that if God wills to bring forth humans through evolution, then their origin must be an inevitable outcome of evolution considered in and of itself. This notion needs to be subjected to theological criticism since it locks providence into unwarranted scientific constraints. A robust theological doctrine of providence neither rests on nor restricts providence to a directionality of evolution from a scientific point of view. Rather, the explanatory burden rests on the transcendent nature of God's providence ordering all created things to ends. This means that scientifically we can at best partially discern such a goal-directedness, for the doctrine presupposes at least partially a wider theological or philosophical perspective on nature. Only if the perspective is not exclusively scientific but also includes theological and philosophical considerations, can one make intelligible such a goal-directedness. The directionality implied by the proposed model of providence is compatible with, but not reducible to science. The scientific and theological statements do not contradict each other because they refer to evolution under different respects either abstracting or including divine primary causation. If we abstract from God's involvement in creaturely causation and focus on secondary causes only, then biological evolution might indeed turn out to be contingent in the Gullian sense. But if we take into the consideration God's transcendent and universal causation in creaturely causation, then natural contingency and accidental causation, real with respect to natural causes, appear to be ordered to an end by God. Thank you.